and welcome to The Brief. I am Jafar Hassanan. Seven years ago, Egypt witnessed the overthrow of its first democratically elected president, Mohamed Mursi, in a military coup. The Muslim Neighbor Brotherhood member had been in office for only a year when the Army Chief General Abdel Fattah el-Sisi announced a deposition on the 3rd of July on state television, along with the suspension of the Constitution and the installment of an interim government. In just over two years, Morsi became the second Egyptian leader to be toppled during a wave of popular uprisings that swept across the Arab world in 2011. The Egyptians also overthrew the 30-year rule of Hosni Mubarak. The social and political upheaval during those years plunged Egypt into an economic crisis and deeply divided the nation. Now, since then, Putin's leader El Sisi has launched a relentless crackdown on political dissent, killing or imprisoning thousands of Mursi supporters and members of his now-banned Muslim Brotherhood. Dozens of youth were also slapped with a death penalty for politically motivated charges. Morsi was placed under arrest along with several other Muslim Brotherhood leaders. In April 2015, he was sentenced to 20 years, but a month later, he was sentenced to death. A year later, an Egyptian court overturned Morsi's death sentence and he remained in prison awaiting a new trial. However, on June 17, 2019, the first democratically elected head of state in Egypt's modern history died aged 67 after collapsing in a Cairo court. So the Muslim Brotherhood described Morsi's death as a full-fledged murder and held Sisi responsible for the death. Soon, we will be joined by a special guest to discuss all this and more. Let's begin today's brief. So, Mohamed Mursi, the democratically elected president of Egypt, was widely regarded by many as someone who would change Egypt, someone who would bring democracy back to Egypt. He was a sign of hope for the people of Egypt. Let's take a look at Mohamed Mursi's profile. Who was he? How did he come into power? Let's find out more about his political career in this special report. Then I'll be back with you. Mohamed Morsi was born on August 20th, 1951, in Al Shakia Governorate on the eastern side of the Nile Delta. He studied engineering at Cairo University, earning a bachelor's degree in 1975 and a master's degree in engineering metallurgy in 1978. He then travelled to the United States to continue his education, earning a PhD in engineering from the University of Southern California in 1982. In 1985, Morsi returned to Egypt and became a professor of engineering at Zagazig University, a position that he held until 2010. Morsi also became active in politics as a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. In 2000, he was elected to the People's Assembly. Because the Muslim Brotherhood was formally banned in Egypt, he held the seat as an independent. During this time, Morsi pressed the government to enact political reform, calling for the lifting of repressive measures. <laughs> Morsi lost his seat in 2005 when the administration of President Hosni Mubarak used electoral fraud to reverse the gains made by the Muslim Brotherhood in 2000. In 2006, he was arrested and imprisoned for seven months after participating in protests calling for the establishment of an independent judiciary in Egypt. Mubarak's ouster cleared the way for the Muslim Brotherhood to participate openly in Egyptian politics and to that end the group formed the Freedom and Justice Party. Morsi won the largest title in the first round of voting in May and defeated Ahmed Shafiq, a former Prime Minister under Mubarak, in a runoff held on June 16 and 17, 2012. On June 30, Morsi was sworn in as President. <laughs> أن أحافظ مخلصاً على النظام الجمهوري 
وأن أحترم الدستور والقانون وأن أرعى مصالح الشعب رعاية كاملة وأن أحافظ على استقلال الوطن وسلامة أراضيه Morsi's first major foreign policy success came in November 2012 when he garnered international praise for helping to broker a ceasefire in a conflict between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. On November 22nd, the day after the ceasefire took effect, Morsi issued an edict declaring that his authority as president would not be subject to any form of judicial oversight until a permanent constitution came into effect. The decree also removed the court's power to dissolve the Constituent Assembly, a 100-member body responsible for drafting a new constitution. Morsi defended the edict as a necessary measure to protect Egypt's transition to democracy. On November 30th, the Constituent Assembly approved a draft constitution. Morsi called for a referendum on the draft to be held on December 15th. Both opponents and supporters of Morsi staged rallies around the country, resulting in some of the largest demonstrations since 2011. Crowds demanding Morsi's ouster gathered at the presidential palace and ransacked several Muslim Brotherhood offices. Clashes between Morsi supporters and critics in late June 2013 culminated in massive anti-Morsi protests around the country on June 30th, the first anniversary of his inauguration. On July 1st, the head of the Egyptian armed forces, General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, issued an ultimatum, declaring that the military was ready to intervene to prevent chaos in the country. Morsi responded to the protests by offering negotiations with the opposition. On July 3rd, the military made good on its ultimatum, suspending the constitution, removing Morsi from the presidency. Morsi was placed under arrest along with several other Muslim Brotherhood leaders. In late July and August, the security forces violently suppressed demonstrations against Morsi's removal, killing more than 1,000 protesters. The Muslim Brotherhood was formally outlawed in September. Morsi faced separate trials for a variety of offences. In his statements in court, Morsi refused to recognise the legitimacy of the proceedings against him and insisted that he remained president of Egypt. <laughs> محاولات مستميتة لكي تسرق هذه الثورة لكي نعود إلى المربع الأول لكي نبدأ من جديد الأمر الذي أرفضه تماما ولا أقبله ولا أوافق عليه in April 2015, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for inciting violence against protesters. A month later, he was sentenced to death. In 2016, an Egyptian court overturned Morsi's death sentence. Morsi had remained in prison while awaiting a new trial. On June 17, 2019, the first democratically elected head of state in Egypt's modern history died, aged 67, after collapsing in a Cairo court. The public prosecutor said he had collapsed in a defendant's cage in the courtroom shortly after speaking and had been pronounced dead in hospital at 4.50 p.m. The Muslim Brotherhood described Morsi's death as a full-fledged murder. It also called for crowds to gather at his funeral in Egypt and outside Egyptian embassies around the world.
right. Welcome back. Now, as you saw in the news report, that Mohamed Mursi was the democratically elected president of Egypt. Morsi gave hope to the people of Egypt, but later he was ousted by a military coup. And now Egypt is run by El Sisi, a dictator. And the Egyptian government has turned into an Egyptian regime. Now, over the last few years, uh, Sisi has uh, launched a crackdown on uh, journalists, on those who have a voice which does not really agree with his government policy. Let's discuss this further. Joining us now in the studios is Motaz Matar, a very famous Egyptian journalist. Uh, he has his own program as well uh, in the Arab world, which is watched by millions of people. Uh, it's great to have you in the studio, so uh, Motas. Now, let's begin by so. talking about Egypt. The last uh, five to eight years have been very uh, difficult for the Egyptian people. I mean, those who do not agree with the president, Sisi, are either forced to flee from Egypt or they either receive some sort of threats. So, um, as a journalist yourself, what are your thoughts on the Egyptian regime right now? Uh, I thank you for your uh, acceptance and hospitality and for the audience. The last seven years wasn't only hard for the for some of the people. It's also for the whole region. Other countries are affected, like uh, KSA, for example, Libya, Yemen. All were affected with this. Days are proving that even Netanyahu and others from the government they are all uh, ensuring that CC is a gift from uh, from the sky to us. Revolution now. Now is suffering and having many challenges. Many people were threatened to be killed for some media people, journalists, and even CC said the same. They are frightening people, and while in the past days he was saying that they are not, they were trying to destroy the, the buildings, and now uh, even Turkey is affected with this situation. Indeed, uh, I mean, uh, over the last uh, few years, we have. Uh, seen some major developments taking place in the region of Middle East. I want to broaden this topic a little bit now. You are a journalist yourself. You have actively followed the developments taking place in the Middle East. Uh, now, especially under the presidency of Donald Trump, the U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East seems to be changing. For example, Saudi Arabia is now buying more and more arms and weapons from countries such as the United States. Peace deals are being reached between countries such as Israel and the United Arab Emirates. So, as an experienced journalist, what do you think is happening in the region of Middle East in the Arab world? Everything happened in the, in the region 
unless what happened in 2013, unless that happened, uh, UAA and, and other countries weren't, weren't have this situation now because Egypt and especially Islamic current in Egypt, which has 100 million of people, the plan was to make uh, Egypt away from the the stage, even Syria, before what happened in Egypt, 2013, after then, what happened in Syria was terrible, was more than we expect. Three of my brothers, even, uh, tens and, and, and thousands of prisoners due to their rights, due to what happened in, in Egypt. Uh, to restore the balance in the, the region, in the Middle East, um, the situation in Egypt needs to get uh, to the zero point. Okay, so what you're suggesting is that Egypt is a key player when it comes to the region of Middle East. Unless peace and democratic rule is restored in Egypt, are we going to see more and more turmoil in the Middle East? Uh, yes, sure, the situation will get worse. I'm so worried about KSA. The scene is not... And what is um, Muhammad ibn Salman is acting now will, will affect KSA with bad effect, and this is a plan to make KSA in two parts. And I believe that and Erdogan has spoke about this situation and, and said that he's worried about the situation in KSA, and any Muslim will, will feel the same worry. Uh, yes, I am ensuring that uh, unless the coup is away and the situation is back to the normal situation in Egypt, this, the situation in all the countries and the region will remain okay. and get worse. All right, just uh, to remind our audience, we have a simultaneous interpreter here, so that's why there is a delay. Uh, just letting you guys know in case it looks a little awkward. Okay. Now, uh, moving forward, you mentioned Mohammed bin Salman. There is a whole controversy revolving around Crown Prince MBS. Jamal Khashoggi, Saudi journalist, was brutally killed in the Saudi consulate here in Istanbul. Now, many organizations across the world, including the CIA, I believe, has, have said that MBS had a role to play in all of this. Now, Jamal Khashoggi was also a very famous journalist, not only in the Arab world, but across the world. He worked for the Washington Post, and his killing sent shockwaves across the world. It shocked much of the world. In, in fact, for me as a journalist, it's hard to think, how can my own country's consulate be the place where I can be murdered? So I'm sure you must have followed what the general opinion was coming out from the Arab world after the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Tell me, what are your thoughts? And did you know Jamal Khashoggi personally? Jamal Khashoggi, 
داخل الاستديو على الهواء جمال جمال خاشقجي was online with me for all over an hour last before his death from my interview with him and many of the media channels are having parts of this video and this interview. Yesterday, KSA has gained. KSA couldn't have a chair in the human rights in UN because of what happened with Jamal Khashoggi. Even China could have a place without uh, KSA. Gamal Khashoggi was the first to be killed with this kind of murder before he was killed with three weeks CC has said online, on air, that all who are speaking outside, the, all media, media people outside countries will suffer and will gain their punish. He was not speaking, CC was not speaking only for uh, Egyptians, he was the first of uh, these people who suffered was Gamal Khashoggi. L let me speak about Gamal Khashoggi and let's imagine that, for example, Turkey said it will cover the situation and close the case and ignore that uh, Muhammad ibn Salman has killed him with normal calculations Turkey how much how much how much Turkey can gain from this from ignoring this case and, and overcoming this situation that's why we we must um, say for Turkey, thank you for your support, uh, unless you are standing uh, till now and supporting this case, you can uh, close it and uh, everything will be uh, better for you, but okay. worse for the rights. All right, indeed, great analysis there. Now, uh, moving forward, again, sticking to Jamal Khashoggi, uh, Mr. Matar, it's been more than two years now since Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside the Saudi consulate. We still don't know where is the body of Jamal Khashoggi. What does it tell us about the current state of the world? We live in the 21st century, 2020. We have all this technology here and we can't find where is the body of a famous journalist I mean, what is going on there? Do you think the international community has failed in bringing justice to Jamal Khashoggi? This is the normal question which uh, a Turkish authority is asking all, all times, where is the body of Gamal Khashoggi, is not, is not a question to have the answer. They know, of course, what happened for the body, especially that Turkey has announced about some parts in the oven of the ambassador's uh, villa. Uh, there's a word for Gamal Khashoggi that who are knocking all times will have the door open. That's why maybe Turkey is trying to keep knocking. Keep knocking is to keep pushing 
and keep the case in front of eyes. And, and that's why we hope, inshallah, with this to have the solution for this situation. Today, Trump is, is available. Maybe tomorrow there is no Trump. Some power are seen today. Maybe tomorrow there is no power. Muhammad al-Salman, for example, for his support, support gaining from, and his, the support he's gaining from uh, Trump maybe uh, will get differ, different situations. That's why uh, the situation is not balanced. Okay. So you were saying eventually, eventually, maybe not now, maybe not now, but after a few years, justice will be served. Maybe not now. That's right. But in English, we all slowly but surely. Yes, there is a, uh, an English proverb, uh, slow but sure, yes. And I believe in this with Jamal Khajokji. Slowly but indeed, sure. Indeed, indeed. That's what we surely. hope for and that's what we pray for as well. Because what happened to Jamal Khashoggi should not happen to anyone anyone in the world. I mean, his family does not even know where is the body of Jamal Khashoggi. Now, let's move forward uh, with our discussion on this episode of The Brief. Let's uh, talk about Palestine and Israel. Now, again, over the last few years, some strange developments took place in Israel. Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. And uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu announced new plans of annexations, peace deals reached between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, something we could not even think about back in the 1990s or 2000s. I mean, uh, UAE making peace deals with Israel, Israel a country which the United Nations says is occupying lands of the Palestinians. So, as a journalist, how have you noticed this change? What is your evaluation of this whole change in the relationship of, between countries such as the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Israel, now Bahrain as well? So, what are your thoughts? There was no any change. The situation is the same. It's, it's only becoming uncovered. The relation is now clear. They are proving that this relation was strong and, and along many years. Mohammed bin Zaid, for example, was, was, uh, is, there is no nothing new. Only due to the coup in what happened in Egypt, uh, this is now clear for uh, for audience. Let's say, for example, I I'll get outside and say uh, and talk. If if I if I talk to others and and tell this program is mine, I'll I'll sell it for anyone. This is not my right. I, I can't do it. For Palestine, these situations and circumstances is proving that Palestinians. And the authority of Palestine, like Fath and Hamas, are getting near to each other now. They even came to Istanbul. That was a dream before. The situation was not good before. Neither Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Bahrain can, can, can make a difference in that equation. Normally, the dune comes after the darkest 
darkest hours in the night. And I believe that we are uh, leaving this uh, black and, uh, and hollow uh, uh, hours. Okay. Now, we are uh, moving towards the end of the program. I want to take the discussion back to Egypt. Protest erupted last year in Egypt after a whistleblower uh, came uh, out. He highlighted the corruption of uh, the CC regime. That person is now living in a self-imposed exile in Spain. We are seeing some small protests taking place again in Egypt. Now tell me, what are these protesters demanding? And to what extent can we say that such protests are going to bring a change to Egypt? In 2012, when the coup uh, took place, some many, many protesters, like 6th of April and others, now the situation in Egypt, many Many currents have gathered together against Sisi, which we can't imagine. Now Sisi has built many prisons and gained, and gained millions, billions of, of, of pounds to Egypt, where nothing the loan now of egypt is 5 5 billion dollars cc has stolen even from his supporters their money now mr matar this is what i wonder this is what i wonder if the corruption committed by CC is already out there in the open. Everyone knows that he is involved in corruption. He has stolen the money of the Egyptian people. Then who is protecting him? Who is the protector of CC? The only one who is supporting him and defending him is Israel. It's not a conclusion or analysis. Israel tens of, of videos stated that uh, whenever CC is down, that will be a damage for Israel. Men who will KSA and AEE, Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia couldn't even complete their support, their financial support. The stop of this, the stop of this financial support from KSA and AEE, UAE, because they are money now is, is zero. He is now suffering the most the hardest problem for him since the coup. Along the, the past days, he was three times in three speeches. He's speaking about the media outside, the, the protesting media outside Egypt. He's, uh, that means that he's, he's suffering and he's getting uh, uh, to hell, inshallah, and he's uh, okay. soon. Okay, I have to add one more question here. Now, uh, Turkey, 
the country where we are uh, in right now, is also coming out as a key regional player in the Middle East. Uh, what are your thoughts on Turkey's foreign policy, especially when it comes to regional issues such as Libya, such as Syria, and uh, most recently, for example, Azerbaijan? What are your thoughts on Turkey as a regional power in the Middle East? And why do you think uh, some countries, for example, Egypt, are not uh, fond of Turkey's foreign policy? Al Musgar Ad, the security person, is the intelligence uh, minister in Israel. He said that Turkey and Egypt were getting close to each other. He means the revolutionary uh, period. That's why Mohammed Morsi. Uh, getting down was a, was a must. Now Egypt is getting, is suffering. Let's get back to Turkey. Turkey now is inflection point. It's trying to gain a place. Maybe it's a strong country in the region. Turkey is now in the neck of the glass. She's, it's trying to get out some of the of what Turkey made for itself and some Turkey was forced to make. This is the hardest period for any country. Turkey, for example, is speaking about Syria. She was enforced to, to take place in Syria for Azerbaijan, for example. Turkey was enforced again to support the right and to be against. For example, even Jamal Khashoggi, she was enforced to support the right. Uh, in Libya, the same. Turkey wasn't trying to have a problem for itself. She was enforced again. She had an agreement with Libya and stood in front of Greece. Turkey now is in inflection point. It's special age. The transition period from a normal country to a big country. To, and that's why it's affected in the economy. And all of us are, are feeling this. To gain Turkey, the, its place, the normal place which it deserves, and this is the equation where uh, Turkey has, and especially the government, uh, has to uh, enforce itself to have the right place for itself. And I think they are, uh, they know that, and they are gaining. Okay. Her. Uh, so, just to uh, summarize what you said, do you think Turkey could emerge as a superpower in the upcoming few years? The other question? Before, before few years, I think that it will be, inshallah, in few uh, years so fast. Many reasons for this, for example, coronavirus, and where many people now and circumstances are mixed, that speeding, has speedened the, the, the curve, and normally Turkey needed 
maybe seven years for, to take its place. Now with Corona, it, the curve is, is uh, speeder. And I'm ensuring that how to pass this uh, period with the minimum uh, economy uh, loss. All right. Uh, uh, Motas Mathar, thank you very much for taking out the time and to uh, come coming to, to our studios. We really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, to those of you who are watching us right now, uh, Motas Mathar also has his own program uh, in the Arab world. He's very famous. So just uh, visit his YouTube profile and you can check out his show uh, there. He does talk about politics like we did on this program. Uh, any last thing you would like to say? Thank you for you, Dafar. I am very happy because uh, I stay with you in this uh, studio. And thank you for your people. You see us uh, now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it once again. And this brings us to the end of another episode of The Brief. I will leave you with a profile of the Egyptian uh, president, El Sisi. On that note, I'm Jafar Hassan. Stay tuned. I'll be back with you with another episode of The Brief next Tuesday. <laughs>